Yes. All right. Hi, my name is Josh Roy. We're sitting here in a, a renovation project in Northeast D.C. Uh, coming soon. I have two heavyweight investors in the DMV with me here. Uh, Mr. Joe Asamoah, also known as Dr. Joe, and Mr. Brian Shanklin. Uh, both of these two have over 20 years experience in this uh, real estate business. They've seen a lot of the ups and downs. Um, they're very familiar with what real numbers are and how to overcome a lot of the challenges um, that many invest investors face. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of talk to both of them uh, about the different strategies um, as it involves with buy and hold versus the fix and flip strategy. Um, Dr. Joe is heavily invested in the buy and hold. You're almost, what, 100% buy and hold now, right? Hundred percent. Okay, so we're going to talk way. about the only way. Only way. Only way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, Brian, he is a developer, so he's brought into a lot of renovation projects where people are doing uh, joint venture, fix and flips, things of that nature. So he has a buy and hold portfolio as well. But because he's a developer, he does a lot of fix and flip uh, projects for his customers and clients and partners. Um, so, Dr. Jeff, first we'll start with you. Yep. Um, first of all, how did you get into the business? Um, what kind of, what's, what's the path that you entered? Did you come up under a mentorship or you just said, I'm going to roll my sleeves up? Or tell us how about, how about you, uh, you, you went about yeah. it. Yeah, uh, essentially what happened was that I used to live in England. When I came to the U.S., uh, okay. I was working for a few months here and my boss had been fired. Okay. Uh, you know, I came back from vacation and he was gone. Wow. So um, I hooked up with him a few weeks later, and um, we had a really good conversation. Okay. And the gist of it was that he said, "No big deal. This happens. This is America." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the real world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, "Well, I have these rental properties, uh, so I have this passive income okay. that's coming through every month. So it's okay for me. You know, I've got this uh, income stream." So he says to me, you know, you may want to check this real estate thing out. And if you do, uh, if you buy anything, try to keep it. Don't hold, don't sell it. Okay. Uh, you know, in the long run, you'll really appreciate that. And you'll get passive income, you get, uh, you know, appreciation, all the benefits of real estate. So explore real estate. And if you do anything, try and hold on to your properties. Mm -hmm. And that was really the genesis of uh, what got me into this thing. I knew nothing about real estate. This guy at that time, I think he had 10 houses. And mm. uh, to me, anybody owning more than one house is like unbelievable. Yeah. So, <laughs> You're rich. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 this guy had 10, I was like, you know. I got you, I got you. <laughs> you know, and so, and so that's really what started me. I bought my first house in DC, 87, $40,000 in Columbia High School West. Oh, yeah. And uh, people at that time told me I was getting ripped off. I was paying too much. Mm. Uh, and this house had tenants in there. It's a long, long, disastrous first, uh, you know, approach into real estate. It's a complete disaster. Everything went wrong, mm -hmm. but it's okay. I learned a lot from that experience. I just kept on buying more houses, mm -hmm. kept on buying more houses, but I kept my houses. Okay. And until 2003, when my income from my rental properties equaled what I was making at uh, my job. Mm -hmm. And so that was what the path I took, why I took it, and what led me to sort of uh, financial independence. Awesome, awesome. Okay, uh, Brian, how did you get started in the real estate um, business? I got started in the real estate business back in the 80s. I actually actually worked for my aunt and uncle. They used to buy, hold, and flip property. So okay. I actually learned from them. Then, then in the 90s, I became a real estate appraiser in 1991. Mm -hmm. Study under a guy named Stu Reynolds. He was um, the head of uh, uh, the, real estate, uh, the real estate commission board and also the uh, appraisal board. Then I got real heavy into real estate investing in like 2001, 2002. That's when I started my actual custom turnkey real estate um, model, basically flipping two properties, holding one, flipping two properties, holding one. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. I, I know we could probably do a thesis on this, but yeah. just kind of at the high level, uh, what are some of the challenges that you face in the buy and hold strategy? I think as a buy and hold investor, <clears throat> The biggest challenge if you're holding properties is that you're going to have tenants. Okay. And so the biggest challenge is managing those tenant relationships. Mm -hmm. And it really all starts on your screening. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, especially in the DC area, especially Washington DC, it's easy to get someone into your house. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more difficult to get them out yeah, once they're in. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. so DC is uh, a whole other world. Yeah. But the, the, the bottom line is that uh, 
if you can't manage that process of screening tenants, uh, then you're destined for disaster, you're yeah. destined for failure. Mm -hmm. So I will think that, uh, you know, one of the biggest success uh, I've had is being able to understand that process, be very thorough, mm -hmm. and therefore get the right person into your home who's going to stay in your home for a long time, pay the rent, keep it up, and things like that. Okay, awesome. Uh, again, I know we could write a novel on the challenges, but just try to keep it at the high level. What are some of the main challenges you usually face with the, the fix and flip strategy? Well, I'm gonna go on the actual buy and hold side, um, buy and hold side, then go to the, um, the okay. flip strategy. Like I say, um, with the rental properties in DC, I really don't have problems with the tenants. Okay. Uh, not even the ones in PG County, but the, the tenants in Baltimore, um, they're a different animal. Different, different breed. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's uh, too heavy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so I advise people when you go into Baltimore, basically project, uh, basically property manage your own uh, properties up there because uh, the, some of the property managers up there and some of the contractors have different philosophy. Your level of a good rehab is, is a different level than uh, what, they, what they actually believe or what they actually think. But um, the problems I have on, on, on most of my actual flips is basically managing your contractors. It's mm -hmm. the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. I don't let my contractors pick out nothing. Color schemes, nothing. I basically uh, project manage every accident. Yeah. Michael manage that every whole process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. They choose nothing. <laughs> yeah. I got you. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the bad. So let's talk about some of the good. Um, you, you started to touch on some of it when you mentioned uh, appreciation. Um, talk about some more of the benefits of sticking with the buy and hold strategy. Yeah, I mean, the, only thing I, the analogy I can give, I think everyone's heard of that story, the golden goose lays golden eggs. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, you have this golden goose, which in real estate terms is the real estate, the asset. Okay. It lays golden eggs. Uh, the golden eggs in real estate would be the appreciation, mm -hmm. the cash flow, the tax benefits, the ability to leverage the property and the equity bill over a period of time. Sure. So that's, so the golden goose lay these golden eggs. Mm -hmm. If you sell the property, essentially you're giving this golden goose to somebody else yeah. who's gonna take advantage of these golden eggs. Mm -hmm. If you keep the asset, then you're now the beneficiary of these golden eggs. Mm -hmm. okay. So over time, you know, you have these golden eggs being generated. If you buy more properties, you have more multiple golden goose geese lay <laughs> <laughs> multiple golden <laughs> eggs. So you the build, flock of geese. so you have a whole flock of geese <laughs> flying around and, and so on. So really what happens is that um, you're able to build wealth a lot faster because you're keeping these golden eggs as opposed to giving it to somebody else mm -hmm. who's going to benefit from those things. So an example would be, you buy a house, like the first house I bought, I told you about, and $40,000 in Northwest DC. Uh, it was a few years ago, in 87. But I mean, the asset. <laughs> for most people here, of course. <laughs> but it's okay. I mean, at the time when I first bought the house, uh, the cash flow was fifty dollars, which is nothing. Uh, right now, the house is free and clear. The rent is four thousand six hundred seventy-six dollars. Uh, the house I bought for forty thousand is now worth seven hundred fifty thousand. So, so you know, if you multiply that over a number of properties, mm -hmm. it really doesn't take you a lot to figure yeah. out that, you know, this is a vehicle to build wealth and it really is a great way to generate financial independence. Okay. Uh, just a little further on that, um, for somebody that's getting into the market now, there's ninety forty thousand dollars $40,000 properties right. in DC, right. but what would you recommend as kind of a, a comfortable or, or safe spot when you're looking for cash flow margins? Okay. Uh, it really depends on the person. Uh, at that time, I had a job. So I wasn't dependent on this property mm -hmm. to eat. Gotcha. Okay, so obviously fifty dollars you can't pay your car note, you can't pay your, your mm -hmm. mortgage and rent. <clears throat> so you got to take care of your cash needs. Because if you can't take care of your cash needs, if you can't eat, if you can't pay your gas bill, mm -hmm. then it's all well and good to talk about this uh, rental properties, mm -hmm. but you got the food. <laughs> 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 So, it's pretty important. Exactly. So, the, the first thing is take care of your cash needs. Okay. And you can do that through flipping, mm -hmm. you can do that through wholesaling, mm -hmm. uh, you can do that through a job, and, uh, and so on. But don't let the cash strategies be your only strategy. Correct. Because you have to have a vehicle whereby at some point, hopefully, you get a residual income, which will keep it going. So, you know, so to answer your question, you start where you start. Okay. You start where you can. 
Okay, yeah. I mean, I started in uh, Northwest DC, which at the time was pretty bad. I mean, yeah, you yeah. said, I mean, Columbia High School today was not the Columbia High School it was. I, mean, I, I, yeah. I remember the DC 80s. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It, it, was wasn't, a you know, it wasn't uh, <laughs> for the beacon bile. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. You know, so you start where you can. Okay. okay, but the important thing is to start. Okay, and then you, you know, you start those, st you know, step by step by step. Ultimately, you can then transition from one area to another area and so forth. But you have a game plan. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Ryan, talk to us about some of the pros of flipping. The actual um, main benefit is actually for flipping property is basically getting the quick cash. Okay. To take that actual quick cash and put it into buy and hold uh, properties. That's something I actually teach. Take your money from the actual flip, put it in the buy and hold. I'm like, okay. don't go buy a car, don't. Go buy a whole lot of jewelry. Don't blow the money. Don't blow the money. I'm like, <laughs> put it straight back. In. I'm like, my philosophy is do two flips, buy and hold. Two flips, buy and hold, okay. and try to get your actual residual income up to like seven to ten thousand dollars as quick as possible, so you can actually leave your job to become an actual full time investor, mm -hmm. to become a Joe Asimov, the cash flow four thousand dollars off of one property. Got you. One problem. Yeah. 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 That's pretty, that's pretty <laughs> yeah. nice elbow from yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. Especially you have four of those. Yeah. Well, that's like sixteen thousand dollars. So yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, even with like twelve thousand dollars a month, that's good money for most people. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so. But yeah. the only add on to what Brian's saying is yeah. that unfortunately, a lot of the investors, uh, when they uh, you know flip a house, they spend the money. Yeah. So, and that's the problem. That that's one of the downsides. It's very addictive. This sort of quick cash. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's like a feast and famine. Mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're starving for a while, you get the flip, you, 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 know, you sell the property, you get this injection of cash. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if you're not careful, you're going to spend that cash. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and therefore what happens is after, after all is said and done, when you cut through the chase, you can ask a very legitimate question, which is, okay, what do you have to show for this? Yeah. <laughs> what do you yeah, have to show? What's the bottom line? What do you have to show for all this hard work, all this sort of flipping and all these uh, real estate things that you can do? What do you have to actually show for it? Absolutely. Okay. And many people, beyond the material, uh, nice car, and, you know, nice clothes, and you know, mm -hmm. you know eating out well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, yard, you know. Yeah. All the things. Uh, 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 when you get beyond that, they have nothing. Okay, and so they have nothing to show, nothing to uh, to pass on to future generations, nothing to to leave as a legacy, and uh, and that's one of the things about the buying whole model is that at the end of the day you have something tangible, something physical that you can touch and see. You could say this is what I have to show for this, but I mean we'll get through the discussion before. There's buy and hold and what I call strategic buy and hold, mm -hmm. which okay. is two different, completely different things. Okay. I mean, buy and hold for the sake of buy and hold is fine, but there's a, there's a strategy in order to be able to get to what we were talking about earlier on, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the end game, which is financial independence. Absolutely. So it, it sounds like we also hear a discipline component. You can go out and make all the money in the world, but if you don't have that discipline to manage the finances and wisely reinvest, strategically to make more money and build that legacy long term, then what do you have to show for it? Okay? Uh, so, real quickly, um, we're going to kind of just wrap this up, but yeah. one thing that I want to just touch on, because I have you two in the same room, yeah. um, and in my opinion, from different networking events and seminars and yeah. so forth, um, you two are probably the best qualified to speak on real numbers. Yeah. So um, if you could just kind of touch on that real quick, because a lot of people I see, they get caught up in, you know, kind of, oh, I can do this for $30 a square foot, $50 a square foot. Just talk on the importance of that and, and, and you know, how easily you can kind of get caught, whether you buy a hole or flip, um, if you're not using real numbers. You start? Okay. <laughs> so, um, I do, my buying holes are primarily in Washington, D.C. area. I, I like Washington, D.C. Uh, because the rents are higher and the appreciation is there and you're able to, um, you know, to get appreciation more so than other places. So uh, what I do when somebody approaches me with a potential deal, lead, or whatever you want to call it, you know, typically a, a wholesaler will call me, hey, Joe, I got a hot deal. You know, you got to buy it right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, the rehab cost is $20 and uh, yeah, yeah. ARV is at $10 million, you know. It, it happens all the time. You're going to make a decision right now. 50 other people 
wallet. You're right. Okay, once again. <laughs> yeah, right. So once you get once you get beyond that, when you dig into the numbers, what is the true after repair value? Uh, what is the true repair cost? You know, how do you get this fifty thousand dollar repair cost? What, how do you get to that point? So once you dig through and uh, you realize that the numbers, especially the repair cost and the ARV, are inflated. Well, no, the repair cost is usually underrated, yeah. and the ARV is usually yeah. overrated. Yeah. Okay, which means that the spread is usually higher than what it really is. Right. Okay, so as a a seasoned investor, it's our duty, our responsibility, is to build, delve into more details as to uh, you know how factual those numbers are. Once you do that, then you know from my perspective. It's a matter of, if I keep this house, what would be a rent be? Mm-hmm. How much rent can I get from this house? And with the Section 8 model, uh, your rent is based on several things. It's based on the location, mm-hmm. specifically the neighborhood, mm-hmm. uh, because one neighborhood will, uh, will get a different rent than another neighborhood. Okay. And the other thing would be how many bedrooms. So we can buy the same house, and one person may make it a three bedroom, another person may make it a four bedroom, Another person may make it a five bedroom. Mm-hmm. It's the same house, okay? But now we can get three different rents. One for okay. a three bedroom, four bedroom, five bedroom. Mm-hmm. So obviously, as a, if the cash flow is the gain, then you want to maximize your rent. Mm-hmm. So you want to maximize if you're going to play in the sort of the, the housing choice voucher program uh, game, then you want to maximize the number of bedrooms. Mm-hmm. So that way you can get the maximum rent. Sure. And then obviously, once you uh, buy the house, fix it up, you're probably going to refinance that house, so it's like you you replace you replace your short you pay off your short term loans, you know, replace that with permanent long term loans. Okay, and then you'll have a mortgage or you have a debt which you have to service every month. Yeah. So the question becomes, what is the cash flow after you pay all your expenses? You know, what's the net okay. and, uh, and so on. So again, I'm, my position is that I'm into appreciation. Okay. okay, so I'm looking for properties where I stand a better chance of appreciation. And therefore, I'm okay to 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 reduce my cash flow, uh, mm-hmm. you know, requirements because I feel that the appreciation is more important to me. Yeah. Now, somebody else may feel that the cash flow is more important, and therefore the appreciation may not be as important for them. So everybody's different. Everybody has a different game plan. Okay. It's just like where I am right now, I'm more valuable. I see appreciation as more valuable because at the end of the day. It's really insignificant if the house goes from 500 to 800 to 900 to a million. Mm -hmm. Correct. You know what I mean? Uh, And so on. So that's, uh, you know, that's really what I look for in terms of the numbers is, uh, you know, what's the after repair value? What's the repair cost? Once I refinance, what's the, um, you know, the mortgage going to go off the debt, the expenses that's going to be, and what's the rent? that I'm going to be collecting, how do I maximize that rent okay. such that I can at least get a decent cash flow uh, so that, they, that way the house sustains itself, it supports itself. I don't have to, every month, yeah. keep on yeah. injecting money into this house. Money, right? yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah, my philosophy is basically this, the same way, but um, I go out to, you know, like in Baltimore, I go out to cash flow. Okay. PG County cash flow in, um, in DC, I go out to the equity position. Okay. Because of like, like, so, um, <laughs> That's basically it. DC basically equity. I play the actual equity. PG County, DC, um, and um, also Baltimore mm-hmm. equity. Cause like in Baltimore, I can buy a property, be all in for one ten, um, and probably get anywhere from like fourteen to eighteen hundred dollars a month. Mm-hmm. Um, and like DC, let's say, let's use like Deanwood for example. I can probably be all in for like around two sixty, two seventy, and probably get somewhere like around twenty three. Twenty uh twenty four hundred dollars a month, but the yeah. actual property may appraise for like four and a quarter. Yeah. But like in Baltimore, the property that's one ten, the office we're gonna appraise for is one hundred twenty, one hundred thirty. Five years from there, it might be one twenty five. But like in Deanwood, that property might be six or seven hundred thousand dollars. I seen Deanwood go from over the last four years yeah. from, from one seventy <laughs> to four to four and a quarter. Yeah, yeah. So crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. Yeah. All right, well, look, I appreciate both of your time uh, answering the questions for the people, Um, new investors. um, These are two really great resources if you ever have the opportunity to connect and get um, accurate information because there's a lot of stuff floating out there, but it's not all accurate. 
So um, do you want to give maybe social media handles or anything like that so people can kind of follow your page and stay up with the information and projects you're working on, stuff like that? Yeah, um, for me, the best way to reach me is my website, which is uh, www.joeasamoa, J-O-E, Asamoa, A-S-A-M-O-A-H.com. You can follow me that way. I do have rehab workshops every now and then where I show people exactly uh, what I do. And I invite them to my properties. And I have several projects going on. And I'm always looking to learn, looking to share information. There's enough for everybody. Uh, the pie is big enough. The demand, especially in the buy hold space, uh, is so great that uh, you, you can't feel it. Yeah. <laughs> There's enough for everybody. <laughs> So, so uh, your information. Uh, you can also follow him on Twitter at Ask Doctor Joe, and also <laughs> Facebook at uh, Ask Doctor Joe and Google Plus at um, Ask Doctor exactly. Joe. Exactly. Yeah, and you can uh, follow me at. Uh, <laughs> it is more right than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can follow follow me at BrianShanklin.com and also at CustomTurnkeyRealEstate.com. All right. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your thank time. You. Thank you for yeah. asking. Answering questions for yeah. the people. Yeah. Um, also, my name is Josh Roy. You can follow me on Facebook at Josh Roy. You can catch me on uh, LinkedIn, Turnkey Homes LLC. Um, and we'll be, you know, continuing to bring you content and updates. Um, and also, if you are, are interested in any joint venturing, um, you can talk, reach out to any of us and um, find out how you can get involved in the real estate game as well. All right, take care.